welcome to the part 1 of uh, fluid flow modeling. So, in this lesson we will be looking at how to model the fluid flow in the melt pool of a weld melt. Very often this uh, fluid flow phenomenon is ignored in uh, commercial software uh, mainly because it is very complicated. Uh, however, as we would see uh, it does affect the melt pool shape and if you want to do a physically based model to predict the weld pool shape then uh, fluid flow is an essential element. So, we would uh, uh, start by looking at what we want to call as a domain and this is a domain which is the uh, sample work piece and uh, as you know that upon the heat source that is applied on top of a domain then you would melt some region and uh, it is in this region that we are looking at the fluid flow phenomenon and uh, people may uh, draw arrows. Uh, to indicate how the fluid flow is happening inside the pool and which way does this convection change the melt pool shape uh, will be discussed as we proceed further. So, what are the reasons why would uh, the fluid uh, liquid melt pool have any convection, why, why does not it stay quiescent that is without any convection. So, reasons why uh, flow will happen is the following. The first reason uh, e is due to buoyancy. So, buoyancy as in uh, it is caused by the gravity and which means that when we have any fluid which is hot and because the density usually is, uh, is uh, decreasing as the temperature is increased for most of the fluids then what would happen is that hotter liquid uh, tends to go up away and uh, 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 colder liquid will try to settle down and uh, this natural way of uh, moving uh, is uh, driven by the gravity which means that uh, when there is no gravity acting then definitely the buoyancy convection is suppressed and uh, this would be one uh, driving force for the liquid to have convection because there are temperature differences within the pool and uh, you can see that the temperature is highest here and it is melting point along this line of uh, fusion zone. So, which means that there is a temperature distribution which implies that there is a density distribution and whenever there is a density distribution upon acting by the uh, gravity you would have buoyancy that is taking place. The second reason why the fluid flow will happen uh, is because of surface tension Marangoni convection as it is called. So, the reason is basically whenever the surface tension is uh, changing with respect to location this would act. So, the surface tension is actually uh, a function of temperature and we already know that uh, temperature is a function of distance in our case which means that there is a surface tension changing as a function of distance and the changes in surface tension lead to uh, convection which is called as the Marangani convection. So, that is a second important reason why there would be a uh, fluid flow within the melt pool. The third reason uh, would be the electromagnetic force. So, electromagnetic force is because if you have arc melting uh, or uh, electron beam melting you would have basically current that is going through the sample and uh, part of the sample is actually uh, liquid which can move. So, whenever you have a moving conduction conducting body through which uh, current is going the current will actually induce magnetic field and uh, coupling the magnetic field and the current direction you would have electromagnetic force that would be coming in. Okay. And there are uh, minor other reasons that would also play a role and those minor reasons uh, are also listed here. Uh, for example, gas flow. So, on the top of the uh, weld pool you have uh, the gas shroud and that is going to have the uh, shrouding gas going away in that direction. So, while it is moving it can exert a certain amount of stress on the surface of the melt pool causing the melt pool also to uh, move. Uh, in this direction. Therefore, uh, you could also think of gas flow having some effect of this uh, and you would have for example, uh, the, uh, the convection uh, uh, happening also because of any uh, uh, rigid body any rigid body motions that are given to the uh, work piece itself 
uh, very often that is not uh, done in the normal welding uh, setups, but if it is given then that would also play a role in the uh, liquid uh, uh, getting convected with him. So, these are the various reasons why the liquid would have uh, the convection and to ignore this completely would be uh, not uh, correct, uh, because it does not give us the right picture on uh, the physical phenomenon that are taking place. And uh, we would try to keep this into account only because we want to predict the shape of the melt pool uh, from the physical principles. If uh, that is not the reason, then one may ignore and then look at the thermal field only beyond the uh, melt pool only in the solid region. Okay. So, these are the driving forces that are taking place. Okay. So, we can actually understand how uh, fluid flow can be modeled within the melt pool by an analogy to the thermal modeling that we have done earlier. So, I would do the analogy across various uh, terms and that would give you an idea on uh, how the equation can be written. Uh, unlike in thermal modeling, where we have derived the entire set of equations uh, uh, because of the simplicity of those equations, we will not be doing that for fluid flow. I will give those equations directly by analogy. But if you are interested in the derivation, I would put up a handout on the uh, course website where you can look up for further details. So, the analogy with the thermal uh, processing is as follows. So, the first thing we would just divide this into uh, two columns and uh, look at how we can understand the phenomena. So, here we would uh, look at the thermal aspect and here is the fluid flow aspect. And uh, first thing is that uh, in the case of thermal, uh, thermal modeling, what is the fundamental equation that is uh, giving the relationship between cause and effect, namely what is called as a constitutional equation. So, the constitutive equation uh, or constitutive relation, uh, which is uh, the cause and effect relation in the case of thermal field E is that J is equal to minus K grad T. That is, uh, heat flux is causing the temperature gradients or temperature gradients will lead to heat flux. Okay. And uh, this is a linear constitutive relationship, which we uh, called by the name Fourier's first law of heat conduction, that is the starting point. And similarly, there must be a constitutive equation for fluid flow. And luckily, most of the time we talk about uh, metals uh, only for welding. And in the case of metals, we have the metallic liquids uh, obeying what is called as a Newton's law. So, the constitutive equation would then be for example, So, it would be basically Newton's law showing you that the gradient of velocity uh, is uh, uh, giving you the shear stress that is acting on the liquid layer or upon acting uh, upon the action of a shear stress you would lead to gradients in the velocity. So, it is somewhat similar the minus sign is not here one can put it in, uh, but then that would change the very definition of the shear stress. Uh, however, we will not do that now and uh, we can see that there is a uh, correlation between the two. Okay. And uh, the uh, overall uh, equation that we are going to look at as a balance, uh, that uh, balance is done in the case of thermal flow um, by looking at enthalpy balance. Okay. So, it was the enthalpy that was balanced uh, uh, for every uh, control volume to look at what is coming in and what is going out. In the case of fluid flow, we would also do an balance and that is basically momentum balance. Okay, momentum balance is what is being done in the case of fluid flow. And uh, the variable that is used for uh, the enthalpy balance is uh, actually H and which we wrote as uh, rho C P T for the single uh, domain uh, region so either solid or liquid, but not both together. And uh, we were then able to convert the enthalpy to the temperature variable. So, similarly in the case of a fluid flow, you would actually have momentum and these are both the per unit volume. So, here also it will be per unit volume and uh, would it should then be rho into u, hmm, because you can see that uh, rho into velo volume will give you mass, mass into velocity is the momentum. So, rho u will become the momentum per uh, unit volume. And what is the, uh, uh, the, the 
uh, variable for which the solution is sought that is basically the temperature variable in this case it will be the velocity and these velocities are basically vectors which means that uh, you could uh, uh, look at the three components of the velocities that are of interest for us. Okay. And uh, uh, we would have of course then the boundary conditions uh, uh, that will be required to close the entire uh, uh, formulation. So, this is how we can form an analogy. So, which means that uh, the governing equation for fluid flow is going to look somewhat similar to the uh, governing equation for the thermal uh, field and uh, we could then uh, look at each term and see how that is different in the case of uh, the uh, fluid flow and uh, try to understand from where it comes. Okay. So, what would be the governing equation in this case of thermal uh, it is basically generalized Fourier heat conduction equation. And in the case of uh, fluid flow, it will be Navier Stokes equation. Okay. And there are some limiting situations for which we wrote these equations. In the case of thermal field, for example, we have uh, limited the generalized Fourier heat conduction equation for a situation where the properties are all uh, location independent and uh, you have a simplistic uh, expression here. And so, th like that we were able to uh, simplify the situation and the same thing is also applicable for flow. We will look at what limitations are uh, kept so that the equation is starting out to be simple. And there are some new parameters we discovered as we went about the derivation and that uh, the last one for the comparison I would do. Uh, some property we came across in thermal would be the thermal diffusivity and which we wrote it as k by rho C p. And uh, in the case of fluid flow also you would come across that kind of a combination of parameters and uh, which you would have it as nu which would be called as the kinematic uh, viscosity and that is equal to the dynamic viscosity divided by the density. And uh, both uh, alpha and nu will have the units of meter square per second. Okay. So, that you could think of uh, the most important parameter uh, for thermal uh, flow thermal uh, field evolution is basically the thermal diffusivity uh, making the thermal field evolve and you can think of for the flow you can think of it as kinematic viscosity making the momentum get diffused or getting distributed. So, like this there is an analogy that we can draw between the two fields so that the governing equation can be then uh, seen directly as an analogy. So, let us write that equation itself here. Okay, so, I will uh, tell you the limiting conditions for which what I wrote is valid, but let me just write it uh, here. And we need to write it for three components because uh, this velocity is nothing but three components u, v, w which means that you would have one equation for each of these variables u along x, v along y and w along z direction. So, we can write first the for u equation u. So, you have the transient term, you have the advection term, advection term is always u v w and then this letter and this direction of the component should match and you have that coming up. And on the right hand side you would uh, expect for example, the diffusive term to be present and uh, there are also source terms we would actually put them here. F x is the body force term, x I am putting uh, component because we are writing for the u component of the velocity and uh, you have the pressure coming also playing a role. So, dou p by dou x and then you have the remaining uh, equation and that would come as this. 
Okay. So, this is the uh, equation that we are supposed to uh, solve and uh, whatever we discussed in the thermal field analogy is applicable for these terms also. So, we could write those terms as follows, uh, we can say that this is the uh, transient term and uh, this is the advection term and uh, these are the body force or volumetric term and uh, then this would then be the diffusive term. So, now that you have seen the equation which is very similar to the thermal field, uh, you could then combine this equation with the thermal field equation and give a name for this class of equations. We could call this class of equations as convective diffusive equations, advection or convection term is here, convective diffusive equation is what is a category of this kind of equation. So, which means that when you are looking for possible solutions, possible methods to solve, you do not have to necessarily look up what is the uh, way to solve Navier Stokes equation, you can actually just ask uh, for convection diffusion type of equations and then the solution would be basically applicable for these equations also. Okay. And uh, let me also then uh, uh, tell you here under what circumstances this is supposed to be valid. This is basically uh, starting point is here, so which means that it is meant for so called Newtonian fluids, okay. all metallic liquids uh, are Newtonian in their behavior, which means that they obey this kind of relationship. So, there is no problem, you can go ahead and use that ap approximation. However, if you are going to use a heat source for a polymeric liquid, to form to join between uh, two polymer blocks for example, uh, then uh, definitely it may not be applicable, you may have to choose a different equation. But uh, that is not a common situation in welding, uh, most of the time you are welding to metallic materials, so this must be valid. And uh, uh, it is also for what is called incompressible flow regime. Um, what we mean by incompressible flow regime is basically to say that the continuity equation or the mass balance equation is going to be in a simplified form, we will come to that shortly. Okay. What is that, uh, why does that uh, come to be uh, similar form, we will come to that shortly. Uh, it also meant for what is called a laminar So, laminar regime is supposed to be ad, uh, assumed so that uh, these equations are adequate to tell you that the fluid flow is governed by this equation and uh, turbulence is not being considered because if you introduce turbulence, there are you know couple of more equations that we may have to solve. So, these are the situations for which the fluid flow will be governed by this kind of a um, uh, governing equation and uh, you would write the same equation for V and W also and when you write for V, uh, wherever U is there, so I would just uh, indicate where you are supposed to replace. Okay, so, you can see that here, 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 here. So, those regions you have to replace u with v to get the equation for uh, velocity along the y direction and when you are doing with v, uh, pay attention to the differentiation here, change from x to y and then when you want to do it for w, then you can again replace u with w and change this x to z here to z and then all these three also to be w, otherwise the template of the equation remains the same. Okay. So, this is how the governing equation would look like. Okay. So, we have seen the meaning of different terms uh, while uh, writing them down, but let me just summarize. Uh, the first term is the transient term, which is basically to tell you how the fluid flow will be changing with respect to time, which means that if you are going to look at fluid flow in a weld pool at steady state, then uh, this term will be ignored. Okay. The second term is advection term, it cannot be ignored, the reason is that advection is already there and that is what you are solving for. So, therefore, the coupling uh, between these terms and the velocity components must be there. So, advection term is always there, it is basically telling you how the momentum can be uh, affected by uh, the different components of the velocity itself. The body force term uh, means basically how the uh, gravity direction or electromagnetic force uh, or the thermal buoyancy or solidal buoyancy etcetera will be affecting the flow. So, this body force is essentially to take into account volumetric effects on the flow. Pressure gradient term will always be there. Okay. The reason being that uh, 
it is coming from the stress by separating out the hydrostatic components. So, this will always be there and this is a diffuser term and this again cannot be neglected because in metallic liquids uh, viscosity is quite uh, high and therefore, this term will not be neglected. It is basically telling you how the momentum is getting diffused by the action of the viscosity, how the viscosity is dissipating the momentum across the entire melt pool. So, this is how the Navier-Stokes equation is going to be uh, telling us the governing phenomenon. Okay. So, here we look at what uh, we need beyond the Navier-Stokes equation to solve for the fluid flow in the weld pool, we need what is called the continuity equation. The reason why we need one more equation is as follows. Uh, how many variables are there which are required at every location in the melt pool? Basically, you have got u, v, w and the pressure. So, there are basically four variables which are at each location in the pool. And how many equations are there for us to solve at each location? You have basically three uh, three Navier-Stokes equations for the three components of the velocity. And therefore, we need one more, and that one equation basically is the continuity equation. So, that you have four variables that are unknown at any location, four equations that are available at every location and therefore, the problem becomes closed. So, that is the reason why we need it, but what does it actually mean? Continuity equation, the meaning of the continuity equation is nothing but mass balance. Okay. And that can be written uh, in this situation like this. And uh, you should, for example, expand this and uh, look at that you could uh, split the two variables for the two differentiations and collect the terms and uh, you would then uh, see that uh, you could simplify it to have what is called dilation to be 0 as an assumption. Okay. So, this is called as rate of dilation. Okay. So, if this rate of dilation it is assumed that implies that the material is taken as incompressible. Okay. So, it is not necessary to take this into account, you could actually use this as a uh, mass balance equation itself and then use the uh, equation in conjunction with the navier stokes equation. It is only that if you take this assumption, then the continuity equation itself becomes simpler and this quantity can also make the navier stokes equation look very simple like the way I have written. Okay. And in case you have not assumed this to be 0, then uh, not only the full equation is valid, the navier stokes equation will have additional terms. Okay. So, that is the only difference, otherwise you can say that continuity equation plus the three navier stokes equation, four equations are required to solve for the four variables at each location in the melt pool. And that is when the problem for the fluid flow is well posed for the entire melt pool. Okay. So, the for problem formulation uh, can be now written, I would just do it by uh, writing in the middle. So, here is how we write the problem formulation. So, solve Navier Stokes equation and continuity equation in the liquid uh, domain or the melt pool subject to initial and boundary conditions. Okay. So, this is the problem formulation to arrive at the melt pool 
uh, convection and uh, uh, why are we doing this solution to obtain u v w as a function of location. So, once you have u v w as a function of location within the melt pool, then if you plot them you can get how the melt pool conversion is taking place and you can get it as a function of time at each time step how does the liquid uh, convection is evolving within the melt pool uh, can be looked at. Okay, so, what would be the meaning of initial conditions because uh, we would have to look at these conditions also. Uh, very often the initial conditions are such that uh, all the velocities are 0 okay, and the pressure is equal everywhere. So, that is a very simple e initial condition and uh, the reason being that you have Uh, the reason being that you have uh, the initial part of the domain is uh, um, basically solid and uh, as time proceeds uh, it is a solid that is melting slowly and therefore, at the time of initiation of melting you can assume that the velocities are 0 to start with and the pressure also is equal everywhere. Okay. Okay, so, that way the initial conditions are quite uh, straightforward unlike in uh, the thermal field where the initial condition can be uh, slightly different when you have a uh, preheating condition that is possible in the case of liquid pool uh, such a condition is not uh, relevant. Okay, and what kind of boundary conditions or special conditions are necessary that we would uh, do now and uh, let me just erase the left side of the board. So, these are the boundary conditions. that have to be applied. Okay. So, if you take here top wall okay, and uh, you would see that the liquid should not escape out. Uh, so, you would basically have the vertical component to be 0 and uh, if you want to have the axis like this then uh, V y vertical velocity at the top wall is 0 and there is no uh, a clarity on how the horizontal component can be there and that I would tell you now here. The horizontal comp component V x at the top wall should be given by a phenomenon that changes the velocity in the horizontal direction on the surface of the liquid pool. And uh, we have already seen that on the surface you have got a surface, and surface tension driven flow and therefore, this horizontal velocity should be given by what is called the Marangoni convection. Okay. So, V x and V z as a function of uh, location on the surface at the top wall should be given by these conditions, V y will be then 0 and that is the boundary condition on the top. And we are making an assumption in uh, writing the conditions like this. The assumption we are making unknowingly is that the surface uh, profile of the liquid pool is flat. Okay. So, which means that we, meet, we need to pay attention uh, So, it is very important that we are making that assumption. Uh, what kind of situations uh, we will not be able to use this assumption is basically when you have surface undulations in the melt pool which will lead to the surface rippling effect. If you want to reproduce the rippling effect then uh, this condition is not valid and we must change that. We will look at those effects later on, but we must remember that we are making that assumption at this juncture. Okay. And uh, what are the other walls? The side walls. And, uh, to know what other boundary conditions should be kept, we must actually remember what is the other boundary that we have. Okay. So, if you are going to solve this only in the liquid pool, then uh, it may be assumed as if this is the boundary. Okay. If this was the boundary, then the boundary condition at that wall is very simple because it is on the solid, which means that you have basically a no slip condition that can be uh, valid or uh, in case you have got this uh, surface moving back and forth then you would also uh, like to take other phenomena into account like, such as the, uh, the uh, change in the density uh, leading to flow at that location and so on. So, basically rigid wall condition can be applied. Uh, 
However, as we have discussed in the thermal uh, modeling uh, lecture already, uh, it is very nice if you are able to have the entire domain in one set of equations and not separate the two, because uh, where you separate that boundary itself is the result that we want to obtain. Okay. So, therefore, it is necessary to imagine that the boundary is actually around here. Okay. If this was the boundary, then what is the boundary condition here? It is very simple, it is all solid. So, the velocities, all the velocities are 0 on the solid walls. Okay. So, that is quite straightforward, we can apply that boundary condition. Okay. Only one tricky thing is that uh, the equation you wrote is valid only for the liquid pool, but then you are applying a boundary condition for the solid part also. How do you separate these two regions? That will be a question that we will answer uh, shortly in this lecture itself. Okay. So, this is the need for the uh, single domain we mentioned. Uh, we have this uh, interior uh, separation between the liquid pool and the uh, solid uh, uh, base material or work piece and this uh, boundary has to be determined as a solution and therefore, that cannot be taken as a given condition a priori and therefore, we need the entire domain to be in a single uh, piece and uh, that is a requirement for us and the way we can arrive at is by two methodology. Oops. Okay, so, we will look at each of those two shortly and I will just give them to you now. So, the way you can uh, ensure that the equations you wrote are valid in the entire domain, uh, but uh, are correctly written only for the liquid pool and they are giving you 0 as the answer for velocity everywhere in the solid is uh, by two methods. The first method of uh, getting that is what is called the viscosity. viscosity change in the solid. So, essentially uh, you can say that mu uh, in locations where the solid is there, you make it take large values. Okay. So, in other words we are trying to define the solid as a very, very viscous liquid that is all. Okay. So, viscosity is so high that uh, liquid is actually not moving and that is as good as solid. So, that is one way by which you can interpret the rest of the region and which means that you would have velocities here like about let us say 10 to the power of minus 8 meter per second which is practically 0 and in the liquid pool you may have more meaningful velocities and that is how you can say that this is solid and that is liquid and artificially you can take viscosity to be very high and you can use that as a location dependent parameter mu which means it can go in and become location dependent and that you can change. Uh, the advantage of doing that is that there is no special uh, formulation required, equations can be used as it is, but the disadvantage is that it is going to be numerically causing difficulties. The reason is that velocities are going to take such a large range of values, you know small values here negligible almost 0 to values very close to 1 meter per second in the top of the melt pool. So, such a large range of velocities are going to take place and the transition is happening in a small region and so there will be numerical instabilities in the solution procedure. So, one must watch out though it is a very simplistic way of handling uh, you could actually land up in uh, numerical problems, but uh, this is one method that could be used. So, that the Navier Stokes equation that we have written can be applicable for the entire domain in the solid as well as liquid. Okay. And how do you know that you are in the liquid? You can use the temperature as a condition. So, whenever the temperature is below the uh, melting point, you can say that viscosity is then very large. Okay. You can use it as a way to update the properties as the temperature is evolving. In other words, we are looking at a coupling between the flow and the temperature field to solve the flow field itself. The other second method is a little bit more elegant method and it is supposed to give you uh, the results with uh, little less uh, difficulties in the numerical implementation that is basically the enthalpy method. Okay. So, it is called the enthalpy porosity approach. So, uh, the motivation for this approach has come from the porous medium flow uh, uh, and porous medium flow as you would uh, recollect you could also look it up uh, uh, separately. Uh, it is governed by what is called the Darcy's law. Okay, and the Darcy's law basically tells you uh, how the uh, fluid flow is affected by uh, the pressure drop across a porous medium and uh, how the porosity will affect the velocity uh, flow through the porous medium. Now, uh, 
uh, that can be applied to the uh, welding situation in the following manner. You could actually treat the region between the solid and liquid here as a mushy zone and in the mushy zone you can say that it is almost like a porous medium approach and uh, you could uh, then use one relationship and uh, you could uh, uh, imagine the solid as the porosity being 0 in which case the velocity will then automatically be negligible. So, you could actually do that and which means that the body force term, this body force term we are looking at would have an additional term that will come because of the porosity uh, approach that we are taking and that additional term would then be looking like this. Okay? If you are looking at x velocity, you would have one additional component would look like this. Okay. So, this uh, formulation uh, can be related to the so called Kozini Karman uh, expression that is used for the porous medium approach, the 1 minus epsilon square and epsilon cube. This is quite uh, familiar for those who are uh, familiar with the porosity approach. The constants are as follows so the k is the permeability. And the meaning of permeability is the ability of the porous medium to allow the liquid to go through it, which means that if you take the permeability to be very high, which means that the velocity will die to 0 uh, very quickly uh, when the region is changed from liquid to solid. And if you take permeability uh, k value to be very small number, then that can actually spread over a uh, uh, more range. And b is a very small a small number to ensure that there is no numerical difficulty. Okay? Now, you can inspect this term to see whether it will help you in making the uh, velocity go to 0 in the solid, so that the uh, equation is valid or not. Okay? So, that you can do it by inspecting this term plugged into the Navier-Stokes equation and ignoring all other terms. Okay? So, I would uh, demonstrate that now. So, this is how you could write the entire equation, I am putting dots to avoid uh, having to write all the other terms and which means that you could see that uh, this guy is uh, going to go as minus k 1 minus epsilon square u by epsilon q plus b and this u I will put it on the right hand side as follows. Okay. So, which means that the relative change in u with time is given by minus k into this. Now, what happens in the solid region? Epsilon is 0 and what happens when epsilon is 0 on the right hand side 1 minus 0 that is 1 square and 0 cube plus b. So, which means that this expression is going to look like this. It goes as minus k by b. Now, I already told you that b is a small number for numerical uh, reasons and k is a permeability which can be taken as a large number. So, which means that it is a small, large number divided by small number which means it is a very large number typically 10 to the power of 8 or 10 to the power of 10 etcetera and with a minus sign which means that this term is going to essentially drive the magnitude of the velocity go, going to 0 because relative uh, change in u dou u by u relative change in u with respect to time is negative. Okay. So, which means that this is going to ensure that u magnitude is going to approach 0 okay, as you iterate. Okay. So, this formulation will ensure that in the solid when epsilon is equal to 0, the velocity will be 0. Okay. What happens in the fully liquid region? Epsilon is 1. Okay. Now, what happens when epsilon is 1? 1 minus epsilon that is 1 minus 1 square that is 0. So, it means that this term is dropped. This means that that term the, the so called enthalpy porosity term is uh, 
null ok it is 0. So, which means that you have retrieved the equation which is meant for the fully liquid region. So, in other words this term is not going to do anything to the equation in the fully liquid region. So, that the liquid flow is completely governed by the Navier-Stokes equation with those conditions and in the solid is going to give you the velocity is going to 0 and for in between it will give you a very smooth changer of velocities which means that it is going to give you a velocity field that is going to go from the full liquid field to a 0 value from liquid to solid region as you progress with iterations. So, which means that by using this kind of a term to add to the body force term you will be able to achieve the uh, uh, purpose of single domain approach for this formulation ok. So, this is how you could also model. So, there are two different approaches as you can see the second one is quite elegant and you can plug it in and which means that when you uh, look at uh, publications uh, which look at the fluid flow in the weld pool and the Navier-Stokes equation is written uh, watch out for this kind of a term on the right hand side if it is there that means they are using single domain approach with enthalpy porosity formulation and if this term is absent and no such term is actually there at all then the equation is only for liquid region and then you could ask a question how are they handling it as a single domain what are they doing with the solid region. So, you should pay attention to that aspect ok. So, with that we will just close the first part of the fluid flow modeling and we will continue in the second part.